I was raised in the Eastern Townships, which is um, an area near in Sherbrooke, where you have a, uh, a bilingual community. Uh, there's a long history of Anglophone and Francophone living in the area. Uh, the second aspect is that I was very privileged to live in a family where they valued very much higher education. Uh, my father had a university degree uh, and my mother and my father were very keen in that uh, myself, my sisters, my brothers would get higher education. Um, so I basically pursued my studies um, and after college I decided to go to the university. I did a university degree in political science. Uh, why? Simply because I like very much to understand international relations. Uh, and I was in an environment where there was a lot of discussion about foreign politics. Uh, and that was of interest to me. In the later years of my undergrad studies, I followed a course in political geography. And I was fascinated by that aspect. I said, oh, this is another discipline, which is very interesting. So I decided to do a master degree in geography. And basically it was about political geography and so on and so forth. But I was also very much interested in the geography of Asia. You have to understand that at that time, there were very few Canadian and even fewer French Canadian that had knowledge of China. Uh, so I had a, my supervisor did his PhD in Singapore. So when he asked me, he said, what do you want to do? He said, uh, I would like to do a PhD. So okay, where do you want to do it? I said, I would like to go to Hong Kong. I said, okay, so I was very fortunate to obtain a scholarship. So that's how I came to Hong Kong University. And I wanted to have a Chinese supervisor because I, you don't go to Asia to have a Western supervisor and you want it. And when I met my supervisor, he said, what do you want to work on? And my interest was to understand and reduce unequal exchange. Why? Because of my background in political science. And you have to understand that you're always influenced by the period and the environment in which you live. So I was living in an environment where in the 1970s, 80s, there was a lot of discussion about unequal exchange. All the literature we were reading it was about inequalities uh, and so on and so forth. And I was interested in trying to see how reducing inequalities could foster local development. So when I went to Hong Kong and I met my supervisor and said, this is what I would like to work on. And I said, oh, that's very interesting. And I uh, said, what do you want to do? I said, I would like to know how we can reduce inequalities in China and foster regional development through exchanges. And he thought, this is very interesting. But he said, you know, to foster exchanges, you have to understand transportation. I said, yes, you have to understand the networks. You don't exchange where there's no corridors, obviously. I said, yes. So that means you best become a transport geographer. I said, okay. <laughs> So that's how I became a specialist about transport geography of China. And I conducted my thesis by trying to understand how the development of transportation, mostly the road sector, can increase the income of peasants in China. 
So this is how I became a specialist of this. You have to understand that at that time, in 1980s, when you finish a PhD, the only place where you think you can work is in academia, to work in universities. So that's how I became a university professor. Um, today, it's very different. Now I'm a professor. I train a lot of students. Some of them obtain PhD, but they don't want to work in academia. I some want to work for the private sector. They want, want to work for the government, uh, NGOs, and so on and so forth, which is okay. it's okay. It's the new generation. This is how they operate. So for me, at that time, I could not expect that I could have worked elsewhere than academia. But today, it's very different. So when I did my uh, thesis, you have to understand at that time, uh, if you go to Hong Kong, or either you work on Hong Kong, but at, remember, I'm a foreigner. So when you go to Hong Kong, you want to become a China specialist at that time. Okay? Uh, and I knew the theory. I had very good background on the theoretical framework of unequal exchange, and uh, I knew all the major writers and the literature I knew very well. What I did not master was I didn't have much knowledge about China. So I had to learn a lot of things about China, but it was the history of China, the geography of China, the Chinese literature, uh, Hong Nomong, for example, that you had to uh, understand Chinese cuisine, Chinese language, uh, Chinese people, the behavior. There was a lot of, of, for me, it was like a learning curve. You have to learn a culture, and Chinese culture is very impressive. The other thing you have to do, how do you measure inequalities in China? At that time, China had very few statistical data. So I was spending days, months, collecting material, reading Chinese newspapers, trying to say, oh, in this province they had that length of railways in that year. So I was building up my own database. Today, I mean, you have that very easy from the, for example, Chung Guo Chao Zhong Nian They have the, those data. But at that time, they didn't have that. So you had to build your own database. How? Because my, my supervisor, who was very good, was very strict in measurement, in empirical analysis. When I was bringing a figure, he was asking me, where do you take this number? How do you calculate this? He was very, very strict in this, and that was very helpful to me. And I realized I now have the same mentality with my own students. So. He says, okay, so I was building that database in order to understand how we can measure inequalities and how we can reduce that to time. Um, if you read my thesis today, it's almost obsolete for obvious reasons. I mean, it was written 25 years ago. But at that time, it was a major undertaking just to do this. Uh, and I learned a lot by doing this. Uh, and the, the years I stayed in Hong Kong, one, I made very good friends in Hong Kong. But the other thing, I was able to learn a lot about the Chinese culture. It was very helpful. When I came back to Canada, I was recognized as a China specialist. So people who asked me to give conferences, of course, I was giving courses on China. Uh, uh, I, was, I had research projects on China. And one thing that was very helpful for me, at that time, Canada, had, we still have that, the Canadian International Development Agency. CEDA. And I was approached by CEDA in order to supervise projects in China. They say, you are the, a China specialist, we would like to conduct a relationship, increase international relations between Canada and China, and we are using CEDA as one way to do this. So for 12 years, I was a CEDA project director in China, and my task was to train Chinese students, Chinese professional in transportation, because I knew I did my PhD on transportation applied to China. Of course, I knew about transportation in China. 
So for 12 years, we built three research centers of transportation in China, in Lanzhou, Guangzhou, Shanghai. We train something like several dozen specialists, many women, because CEDA had a policy of uh, women in development. So we trained many female students, and I've met some of those students now, and they are now director, deputy minister in provinces, responsible for transportation. Some are now professors in universities. So it's very good. So they, they have developed, we have developed centers with them. They have developed the teaching program, research program, and now they are involved all over China. So that was very, very helpful. So for me, it was like I realized that the training I had uh, in Hong Kong had empirical cascading effect in China. So that's now very useful. Yeah. You mentioned that um, your thesis was about uh, reducing uh, inequalities and also looking at uh, issues related to the peasants. So uh, we are also doing work on the rural mm. reconstruction yeah. movements and very much concerned about um, the rural situation and the flow of the yeah. peasants. So could you say something more about that? Okay, uh, I will tell you what we found at that time. Uh, today might be, have less implications. But at that time, what I was able to uh, demonstrate is that if you develop uh, network infrastructure, road network, uh, rail network, and so on and so forth, you foster the capacity of local peasants to provide exchanges. And I could see it over, say, two or three decades. When I was going to China, you must understand, I was going to China where at some time there were no bridges, no paved roads, nothing like that. Many villages were living in uh, local autonomy with very little income. You go to China today, in those same villages, now they have a highway. They, they have produce in the market that are coming from elsewhere or they can sell produce, uh, especially with the uh, uh, policy of uh, uh, responsibility system implied in China. So the local peasants could produce food that they can sell to the market. Why they sell it to the market? Because you have a road access that brings you to the market. I'm not saying it's perfect. I'm just saying that we have realized that the income of peasants over, say, the past 25 years have increased in China, partly, partly because you had an infrastructure system that allows to have exchanges. I'm not saying it's perfect, but this is one way that happened. Another issue I would like you to know is that when I did my study, we were concerned about unequal exchange. Environment was not an issue, not at that time. So a few years later, after I did my, all my, my research on China, the government wanted to do uh, a study on sustainability of maritime transport and port development. So it was like a uh, public tendering. Let's say. So I was with my colleagues. I was not, I mean, I was conscious about the environment, but not that much. I mean, very ordinary. And I was talking with my colleagues and said, what do we do? Maritime transport and port was our field of expertise, but mostly from an industrial point of view, a commercial point of view, uh, network point of view. And we realized that, okay, if we apply for that grant, we indicate that we are interested. If you don't apply, you indicate to the community that you withdraw yourself from a field of competence. Never do that. You can apply, you might not get it, but you might apply and you indicate, I'm interested. We realize that the environment will be there forever. So we apply and we got it. But we knew little about the environment. <laughs> so it's okay, what, what do we do? 
So we employ students during the summer. And I said to the students, okay, we employ you for the summer. You will find out everything that has been written on port, shipping, and the environment. So for four months, we read hundreds of articles and books and book chapters in order to upgrade our knowledge to the current situation. I mean, since I was a university professor and I did a lot of research, I knew how to do it. So the students were providing us with a lot of literature. We read everything, said, okay, this is the situation. Okay, now we have to become expert in environmental and shipping and port. This is how we did it. And we wrote a major report on best practice for sustainability for port and shipping. And the United Nations IMO, the International Maritime Organization, learn about our report. And it was translated and distributed all over the world. So we were very surprised to see that. And now we receive research contract on that field because we have became expert. But it's pure coincidence. And so you, it's very surprising how sometimes opportunities will arise and say, don't say no. They just say, said, oh, this is maybe something new that we should tackle. So that's how it comes. <laughs> Yes, and so you are actually uh, very much in the forefront uh, in relation to well, learn uh, research about China and then research about uh, the environment. The environment applied to shipping and ports. Yes, yes of course. Yeah. And what you, you mentioned best practice. Uh, can yeah. you tell us the story, some story about that? Yeah. What happened is that because of that report, then the government had a, what do you say some sort of uh, there's an NGO, and uh, it's called Green Alliance. And so uh, that group is supported by the industry, by the government, by local communities. And they, uh, their task is to implement best practices for port development and maritime transport. And because of that report, I was asked to be part of the committee. So I went to the committee and I contributed, not, I'm not the only one, but I brought a contribution on how to develop performance indicators on protecting the environment for port and shipping. And I've been working on this committee for now almost 10 years. And they have implemented several performance indicators within the industry. And now they extend not only the St. Lawrence system, but also the Great Lakes and also other ports in North America. And the industry is now probably at the forefront of the major concern of sustainable development strategies uh, in terms of maritime shipping and port. It's very impressive. So they, they implement best practice and now it's not something you negotiate anymore. You cannot say, oh, uh, I will uh, uh, build a a port or an infrastructure without considering the environment. No, you cannot do that anymore. It's extremely difficult because you will have an imprint that you will be carrying. For example, I conducted interviews in London with Lloyd's Shipping uh, and I wanted to know to what extent are they considering sustainable development? And they were explaining to me that when you have a ship, you have to have insurance, obviously. But the insurance rate will be reduced according to the quality and maintenance of the ship. So they have developed some sort of what they call a green passport. And it tells you or indicates what is the environmental quality of the ship. In terms of what kind of paints do you have on that ship? Is it anti? What kind of anti-fueling paint? Is it uh, biodegradable? Will it affect the uh, uh, the fish? Uh, what kind of steel do you have? What kind of oil are you consuming? And so on and so forth. And every time they have uh, an item, 
Lloyd's is indicating how much it cost. So the more you adopt green practice, the lower is your insurance. For shipping line, this amounts to millions of dollars. I interviewed the stock market and the banking sector. And I said, why is sustainable development so important for you? So that's very easy. If you want to develop a port, a terminal, a container terminal, it costs half a billion dollars. You need the money. The bank said, okay, we'll lend you half a billion dollars. What's the soil quality? Is it contaminated soil? If it is, we're not interested. For example, I, I interviewed the stock market and people usually when they talk to the stock market people say oh they're just there to make money well be careful when we interview them said I ask why is it important why is it so important the stock market because people investing in the stock market you will not invest in an enterprise that will employ children obviously. So you have pension funds that now have policies. You don't lend money to people who will employ children or have cheap women labor. You don't do that. Now they say you will put money in companies that have adopted sustainable development strategy. Pension funds that have billions of dollars, they can decide where the money will go. And we have begun to observe that. They say, no, we invest money, they say, oh, why don't you invest in that enterprise? I, I want to know what's the environmental strategy of that enterprise. If they don't have any, you don't have our money. Uh, well, you went to China? And so can you tell us some of your impressions about China? Okay, I went to China for 12 years. I was going sometimes several times a year. Uh, we were very busy because we had to uh, help them build a various research centers in transportation. We had to train people, train personnel. Uh, it was a very, very good experience uh, because China was facing, still faces many transportation issues. Uh, in terms of fluidity, in terms of capacity, uh, all modes of transport. Uh, so this, uh, and we were very much involved in developing new methodologies. How do you tackle various types of transportation problems in China by developing new methodologies? Because we realized that some of the methods that were applied in the West could not be applied in China for the sheer size of numbers, for example or the magnitude of the problems. Uh, so this was very helpful and uh, actually we were, we were able to train many Chinese PhD uh, in various aspects of transportation. Uh, that was conducive in solving many of the issues uh, in terms of transportation in China. But, uh, well, apart from the, the work itself, so what were your impressions when you first went to China? Of course, there have been so many changes uh, yeah. over the years. The, I mean, the first time I, was to, I went to China, I was very excited because like, it was a dream coming true. I was finally going to China. Uh, it was not in books, uh, it was not in papers, it was basically, I was physically there. So I realized that, uh, one, it's a very big country in many sense of the word. Uh, I find what I was expecting a fabulous civilization was there. Uh, I find uh, Chinese people extremely welcoming. Uh, everywhere I was going, sometimes I was traveling by myself, and everywhere I was going, even though I could practice Chinese, I speak some Chinese, I always find somebody very helpful, said, okay, we will help you for this and that. that. I was very impressed by that. I saw over the next last 30 years, 
I saw the modernization of China. No countries in the world history has modernized at such a pace um, in terms of uh, income you have a middle class that is emerged in China you have mega cities in China China is now the world's first economy uh, and with this raises new issues that were not there or were there but not the same magnitude you have environmental issues for example uh, we were beginning to talk about this in the 1980s but in 2015 2016 it's very costly uh, you know that pollution in china cost 90 billion dollars every year you have to find solutions you have to develop ways to develop very advanced sewage system you have to learn how to recycle water you have to find ways to reduce thermal power plants you have to find ways to that China has motorized incredibly but this is not sustainable you have to find ways to reduce the environmental imprint of energy consumption in China. It's very important because at the long term it is not sustainable. When you realize that 50% of the coal extracted on this planet is consumed in China, that's a lot and coal is not a sustainable mode of energy consumption I know you're building dams uh, nuclear power plants China is the biggest producer of uh, wind power and solar energy but it's still not sufficient uh, you have to find ways to uh, to reduce pollution level otherwise modernization of China will come at an enormous social and human cost so I know efforts are being made in my field last time I was to China we had lengthy discussion about what we call green logistics how how can you uh, implement a system that reduces the carbon footprint of freight transport and uh, I think that's the correct direction so China is doing working on this it's a long process because even though you know the mathematics the equation it's another issue when you want to implement it uh, I visited uh, some of the ports of China uh, Yangshan I visited uh, many ports of Ningpo uh, along the Yangtze River uh, from Chongqing to Wuhan and they are very much concerned about environmental issues they realize for example when they build the Tree Gorge Dam project it had an impact on water levels for example which had an impact on shipping which increased the cost of moving freight so they, they are very conscious about this but it's like if some of the problems are so big that they have to tackle in various directions and sometimes maybe the priorities are not fixed right but eventually they will have to come to that because it's becoming too costly so I think I believe I sincerely believe that China is promised to a very bright future uh, you have the population you have the youth uh, and the young generation is very much concerned about the environment so I think that's extremely positive uh, last time I went to China and I gave some lectures one that some of the lectures that were the most attractive to young people was when I was talking about transport in the environment so I said okay so and they were they were asking very good questions like how do you measure green logistics uh, how competitive is green logistics as compared to other modes how comparable is China to the United States or Western Europe so they were asking very good questions um, now many countries are adopting SICA that is uh, sulfur emission control areas uh, 
and China has embarked into this system. Uh, China signed an agreement uh, between, uh, with, between China and the United States in order to reduce the impact of climate change, for example, uh, to have uh, both mitigation measures and adaptation measures to climate change because they realize that it's not sustainable. So it's a long process, uh, but I think it's going in the right direction. Is your hobby is to read and to write. <laughs> <laughs> so, what are the kinds of what what would be the, the your writing projects? <laughs> writing projects. Uh, You've written so many. Yeah, I've written so a lot of things. Goes, uh, but sometimes you realize that uh, I would say that the best papers are not necessarily those that you think by yourself. The best papers are those that are asked by others you to do. Because they, for example, if, some, if I say, oh, I'm going to write a paper by myself on a topic that I choose by myself, yeah, I mean, I could do that. But when somebody else, like uh, recently, I know the, I had some friends in China said, we would like you to do a paper on the global iron ore industry and the shipping of iron ore. I said, okay. I found that very challenging and I, I wrote a very good paper, but it was not of my own thinking. It was like a, a request coming from outside. And sometimes you realize some of the best paper are coming that way. Mm -hmm. it's so the more you maintain contacts with people, the more you travel, uh, in my case, traveling to China, you meet people, they say, oh, could you dis do something like that? Like, for example, recently I went to China and people are asking me, can you build something on one belt run road system? And I say, yes, I can do that. I said, could you tell us or explain to us the maritime leg, you know, from the Middle East to China, not the land leg, just the maritime leg. This is your field of expertise. I found it very challenging. I said, okay, I have to know where is China. So I'm working on this. Uh, where is China investing? Who are the partners? Uh, what are the shipping line using that road? So it's not from me, but it's from the fact that I was in China discussing with people. I say, could you do that? Yeah, I could do that. So you realize that the by by if you want to add, have a university career, you don't stay in your office only. This is not the way. You must, you, you must give lectures. You must meet students. They will ask you very tough questions. You have to give conferences. You have to go abroad. So I'm fortunate enough to have very good colleagues and friends in China. So they, they are very challenging. So they say, can you do this? Can you do that? I said, okay. So sometimes some of the best papers. So your question is, is nice, but I don't have the answer because I think it will come if I don't have any friends anymore. <laughs> but since I've got friends and colleagues in China and elsewhere, I've got uh, European friends who are asking me, said, could you dis do something on this? Like uh, we have um, major debates currently on uh, transshipment hubs in the Mediterranean. And uh, it's coming from North African countries. And uh, because they are French speaking, so we have contacts with them. And I say, oh, we like to know how transshipment hubs can help uh, develop the economy after, you know, the uh, Arab Spring that they had. There. So they they say, can you help us? I said, yeah, sure, I can help you on this. And but it's not from me. It's from a request emanating from third parties. And sometimes this is very one because you have to. You have to think very differently. You said, okay, this is the issue. Why is it an issue? How do I measure that? So you use your knowledge in order to do this. So yeah, it's very, it, I think that's the best way to do it. Mm -hmm.